All you guys are like architects here? No? They're, they're from all over the university. Uh, all different things like uh, design? Design, uh, engineering, engineering, business. Business? What else? That's it? What? Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. Oh, that's always a good one. Uh, well, I'll just start then. Um, so my plan is to first um, talk a little bit about me, then talk about good and bad, and then have a conclusion. <laughs> And um, so um, I thought I'd start. Uh -oh. You've got to be able to hear the music. Okay. So Can there's, you the good, the, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, um, you try that. and then there's good. And then there's really good. So that, that's basically what I'm going to talk about later. And um, the, uh, the idea is that humans um, are using new technology to make the world a better place. And I think we, we always think of technology as being these um, computers and stuff. But really, fire was one of the first things that people invented and writing. And uh, But um, Vic, Victor Papanek said that, there are few professions that are more harmful than industrial design. <laughs> and he was talking about the fact that, um, you know, designers design stuff to be obsolete and um, making a lot of garbage and stuff. But that's because, uh, oh, and it gets thrown away. Um, but we also do good stuff. And for instance, OXO Good Grips, which I was involved in designing. So, um, they're, they're good because they function well. And to make them function, we uh, made a lot of different models of different um, handles to try and figure out what would be the most comfortable and the easiest to use. And, um, we, uh, and we were trying to make some that would be comfortable for old people who had um, weaker hands or arthritis and stuff like that. So that um, basically what we figured out was we, if you make a bigger handle, it's, you don't have to use so much leverage to hold it, you know, to close your hand and hold it. And also, we made them out of rubber so that they were, you know, more friction and they didn't slip. So, um, but the smart thing was that we figured out um, the user experience, which wasn't called UX then, but um, we figured out that these things were good for everybody, um, young people too, so the idea of universal design was invented, and these were like the first uh, universal design thing. And basically, they were designed for um, taking into consideration other people's handicaps, which you're not supposed to call them handicaps either. So, now, uh, uh, but the story is really important. And the fact that these, that um, the uh, good grip handles had these little rubber um, fins on them signal to people that they were going to, these were going to be comfortable and that they were going to be fun to use. And so people went into peeling the potato thinking they were going to have more fun. And we designed a lot of other things that were, um, used the same idea of spreading out the um, forces and making them uh, leverage easier to, for older people to use. And um, Jesus was... Uh, to uh, um, put him up as an endorsement on his uh, website. <laughs> the sad part is that um, I think that they were one of the, the knives that I designed was used in a murder. <laughs> okay, so now about me. So I'm named after the Tucker car because my dad was um, one of the designers of the Tucker. And can you hear the music OK? OK. And so here's a picture of him when he was um, younger, I think, before I was born. And uh, so he was an industrial designer. In fact, this is in the uh, chicken coop that uh, Evie's uh, father 
had his advertising agency in, in Ohio. So I was, um, these are my parents. And my um, dad was an industrial designer, so he was like the hardware side of the family. And my mom was the software side because she was a social worker and um, interested in the community and all that stuff. And so I was the convergence between hardware and software. And uh, that mix is important because that's basically what I think is what the strong thing about industrial design because it's a um, multidisciplinary kind of uh, profession. So um, my dad went to Pratt and then when he graduated he started working with this guy Gordon Lippincott. There's my dad and uh, his partner um, Bud Steinhelber in the back. And um, Lippincott started this uh, design company and um, their, one of their big projects was the Tucker car, or one of their small projects. <clears throat> the weird part is that these guys still use the Tucker car in their promotion for their business, and they say that uh, the project was so successful that their designer named their, his kid after him. <laughs> and uh, so they were happy to meet me. Anyway, this is a, a clay model that they, um, that they made in Chicago for the Tucker. And, but anyway, my parents lived in Yellow Springs, Ohio, the home of Antioch College, and um, because my mom was a student there and wouldn't marry my dad unless um, she could finish college. So, um, while, so my dad moved out there and started his own design business there, and one of their first projects was designing the logo for Antioch. And, um, we also were in, steeped in the um, Horace Mann stuff because he started the college and um, he told us, be ashamed to die until you've won some victory for humanity. I'm hoping that the good grips do it for me. <laughs> but here's my dad and his partner Bud and they, since they were out in the boonies, they like to play that up. And this is the logo for V Design Studios and they designed their own um, studio and designed a lot of stuff that's still around, like uh, the darkroom timer. And they designed their, each of them designed their own house. This is my dad's house and that's me in the corner. I'm not sure if I was supposed to be in the picture or not. Um, and one of his later projects was, was pretty cool was um, Dayton, Ohio is near Yellow Springs, and they, um, the, um, he was asked to design something for the um, Aviation Hall of Fame lobby, and so he thought the main thing you have to have in there is something about the Wright brothers. So he took this picture, he had this picture, and he, um, it was the beginning of computers and stuff, so when they, um, computer nerds, I don't think they even had computer nerds yet. Those guys who would be, Nerds used to do stuff like this, like type out uh, Alfred E. Newman, stuff like that. So he took the same idea, but instead of using type, he made symbols for each, um, for each gray tone. And the symbols were all things that had to do with the Wright brothers. And then he put them all together into a, a mosaic of um, the Wright brothers' first flight. And here he is with the... <coughs> um, the uh, founding fathers of the Aviation Hall of Fame. And so my dad was a pretty cool designer, so I wrote, I'm writing a book about him, and this is a movie of the book that gives sort of an idea of what it is. So if anyone's in the publishing business, um, come see me after this, and we can figure out how to um, produce the book. It's almost done, you can see. Uh, 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 that's longer than I thought. So um, my brother and I uh, had a jewelry store in Yellow Springs, and we called it Ohio Silver. And uh, that's why I'm dressed like the Lone Ranger. <laughs> and my brother now lives in Virginia and still makes weird things. <laughs> I went to Pratt. And one of my teachers there was Rowena Reed Costello, who said, 
if you can't make it more beautiful, what's the point? And um, we uh, made this book about the exercises in the curriculum from Pratt that's called uh, Elements of Design. It's a really great book. Um, after I graduated, I started working with Wyman and Cannon, and our, um, the project I was working on was uh, the um, wayfinding system for the zoo in Washington. And then I met David Stoll at a cocktail party, and um, we, I started working with him, and then that turned into Smart Design. And at Smart Design, we were um, sharing the space with uh, Patty Moore, who is a gerontologist, and her thing was dressing up like an old person and finding out what, ha what it was like through the, you know, actually living the, through the trials and tribulations. And um, one of our clients was Sam Farber, and that led to um, Good Grips, which is like turned into a big business. And now I'm working with um, Re Norgard, who's a Danish woman, and she's making these canes, and we're designing stuff for really stuff for old people. Um, after I worked, after working at um, Smart Design for a long time, I went and um, opened the New York office of Frog Design, which is, was founded by this guy, Hartmut Esslinger. And his uh, slogan was, form follows emotion. And there, there's me with our crew. And um, what excited me about working with him was the convergence of all these things. Like, uh, they're basically known for product design, but they had, a, they had just um, uh, acquired a new media company in Austin, Texas, the coolest city in the world. And um, they were doing branding and strategy. But I was really interested in these convergences between the, the, um, the three things, which he called ISDC, which stands for, I forget what it stands for. Integrated, uh, something like that. Anyway, after that, I went and joined Razorfish, which was um, at the time only like uh, 30 people, and it turned into the giant um, digital media place. And what our slogan was, everything that can be digital will be, which was kind of scary, but um, it's, it's true. It's, uh, everything that can be digital will be because it's cheaper, faster, and better. And so one of the things that we built was this uh, vending machine that you could call up on, on your telephone, and it would charge your phone um, for the Coke, and it would come out of the machine. It was really great. And we also um, did a project with uh, Giorgio Armani, which was about like integrating their website with um, mobile devices. Remember those old Palm Pilots? But um, so, but our thinking was the technology was more of an accessory than a um, functional thing. And then I uh, hooked up with these Dutch guys called Springtime, and uh, we designed a bunch of uh, interesting things. This one we did, I don't know how long ago, but it was for, it was supposed to be a prediction of the future of uh, digital gadgets, and we had this flexible like watch thing and it was supposed to be what was going to happen in 2014, which the scary part is that's next year. <laughs> but the good news is Apple's coming out with one. So it doesn't look so crazy anymore. Um, and we designed a car. And then I, um, that springtime sort of morphed into Studio Red, which was a studio at Rockwell Group that was dedicated to um, innovation for Coca-Cola. And the cool part was that it was a really multidisciplinary group where we had architects, um, designers, strategists, graphic designers, everybody working together. And they worked together to solve problems instead of like you do the architecture, you do the um, graphics, that kind of thing. So we designed a whole bunch of things from packaging to subway of the future, uh, <clears throat> vending machines in Japan, 
stuff, bottles and everything. And that turned into the lab, which was um, more focused on digital stuff. Um, mostly with these two guys. One of them, um, is that, um, James, is actually an architect who went to, who was, did work at the Media Lab. And um, Josh is a graphic designer who uh, went to Cranbrook and got into programming. So one of our biggest projects was for the architectural biennale in Venice. And we were supposed to design the uh, introduction uh, part of the pavilion. And the idea was it was um, to take cool movies of architect where architecture is in the future and make it into um, an experience. So this was a, the model that we liked the best, which turned into this experience where we had this sea of monitors showing those movie clips where the computer would take fragments of it and make it into this like um, dynamic uh, uh, projection. So it was sort of like you go through the middle and it's like 2001 with these fragments of stuff. And it worked with sensors in the ceiling. And we, create, we wrote this program that, um, you know, where we could adjust these parameters and make like, it into a cool experience. And each person, when they walk through, has sort of their own little blobby thing. And it looks like this. And then you walk around the back, like in The Wizard of Oz, and you can see like, all the monitors showing the um, clips that are, that are being used. So this is a, a plan. I thought you were all architects, so I threw the plan in. But so it also had a sound element. So the whole place had this sort of background um, music. But when you walk through different places, it would cause different other sounds to happen. So where every time anyone went into this thing, it was a completely unique experience because of how you know, it worked. So here's a little movie about it. So one of the other great things about it was that we had to spend about a month in Venice, like, setting it up. The bad part was it was really hot. And we were in the attic over this 500-year-old um, building doing, you know, working with computers. And every day we would go buy some more fans. Each one of these, like, um, each one of those like, sort of blobs is a, a different movie. And it's, like, um, connected to the person so that as the person moves around, it follows them. And then at certain points, we had this glockenspiel moment where one movie was, took over the whole screen and this different music started playing. And then it would end. And go back to the, the regular thing. Anyway, it was a real production. And it really, um, there was like everything from you know, programming to uh, legal issues.
so then we got a, a project that paid us, which was for the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas. And they, um, we, one of our big projects was the um, lobby. And um, the lobby was kind of, had these gigantic columns and it was really boring. And so we decided to cover the columns in um, high definition TVs and our monitors and then create um, special programs for it. So one, we did different seasons like bubbles and um, the one for fall had these um, uh, things that would happen when you walk by, the leaves would form into different um, things. And so here's kind of like what it looks like. And you can see there's that deer. And, the bu and it's all like um, dynamically calculated so that it's like a computer game. Like all this stuff is being calculated by the computers in real time. So each one of those bubbles is different. And um, it seems when you walk into this room and you see all these bubbles, it's like, oh, there are this is some kind of video, but then you realize that it's not and that these, everything is like, it, it has a, it gives you more of a sense of it being real and alive. And we also designed it as an open platform so that other artists and um, designers could make things for it. And so now that it's an amazing, um, you know, three-dimensional environment that you walk into that has like really cool stuff on it. Yeah, that's what one of the other tricks was that we covered the monitors with um, a two-way mirror, so that when it, when it's black, it's a it's a mirror and it reflects all the other stuff. And then when it's light like this, you can see right through it. It's a, it that also created that great experience. Then I went to work with um, Ralph Applebaum. Applebaum creates interpretive environments, they say. And um, it's a really integrated, you know, multidisciplinary place where teamwork is really important. And they're famous for designing the planetarium in New York and the um, dinosaur exhibits there and also the Holocaust Museum in Washington and more wacky things like Adventure Space Museum where people really get involved. And I was working on the Boris Yeltsin Presidential Center in Russia. And the, my favorite part was the restaurant was going to have a bar, and I wanted to call it Boris's. Because, you know, I don't know you, if you remember Boris Yeltsin, but he liked to drink a lot. And uh, then I started V. Meister Industries. Ay, ay, ay. So now on to the, the good. So design is like a really a, a powerful tool for making things better because we had this great process of checking and um, iterating over and over again. And, but there's like sort of like two ways that you can do it. One is do it yourself. And that's like Raymond Lowy telling everyone what to do and signing all the drawings that everybody makes with his own signature. Or there's um, help each other out where you uh, collaborate and stuff. And the trick nowadays is that those two things are in conflict with each other. So, but working together and jamming is really fun. And leads to better um, products. But um, I also want to say that there's no um, good answers that, every, that the projects that we are faced with are very complex and everything has like a good side or a bad side and there's uh, everything is contradictory and basically designers are stuck between the two hard places. But we can still be successful. You know, the iPhone's a big success, the, you know, our Cosmopolitan, Coca-Cola, Good Grips, and that's because they fit people. And so um, designers have, 
you know, tried to figure out how to fit people the best they can. And one of the things is ergonomics. And so Henry Dreyfus, um, who designed the telephone, used um, ergonomics to make the receiver fit. And that's why it's such a great success. There you go, ergonomics. So ergonomics really got a big start in the, during the Second World War when um, people were inventing all kinds of new uh, weapons. And so they had to figure out how to make sure the soldiers could fit into them. So that, like this gun turret, they had an, they, nobody knew like how big to make it because they didn't know how big a big soldier was or a small soldier. So they, um, they started measuring these guys and figuring and getting a database of those kinds of measurements. So, and they, um, they put them all together in this anthropometric data. And so we, now we can use it to make um, chairs that are really comfortable. But then I was thinking, what about this chair that's not, um, that is not really comfortable, doesn't use all those ergonomics, but when it, if I personally like the chair, so I think it's comfortable. And so I created this idea of psychonomics, which is the mental side of ergonomics, or the flip side of it. So it's sort of like a cross between Alfred Hitchcock and Henry Dreyfus. But it's how we think about stuff is, I think, just as important as how it actually fits. So here's um, Reed Felt. And since I like that chair, it, it um, fits better. And th there's a lot of like, behavior that's caused by um, the environment. Like the study that found out that people are more hung hungry and thirsty if they're in a red room, but um, they eat twice as much if it's yellow. Or my favorite one is the side effects of, um, or the, the design effects of uh, placebos. First of all, you have to remember the placebos don't work anyway, but yellow ones are really the most effective. <laughs> Red ones work faster. You know, ones with a logo on it work better. You know, and also, I don't have it on here, but um, expensive ones work the best. Expensive placebos work like 20% of the time. And so the how how things are designed and how they look affects like how we act in them. Like these different buildings have different emotional effects on people. Mussolini's office had a big, you know, made him seem more important. Or the Bo Borg and the Inside Out building. And like I said before, the um, fins on the good grips make people happy. And so, um, I worked on this telephone answering machine with uh, a student at Cranbrook, Lisa Crone, and basically we um, used the metaphor of uh, file effects to make the function of a telephone answering machine easier. Um, and at, um, Cranbrook was doing a lot of work in product semantics, in other words, the using semantics to make the product seem more informative and easier to use, like this um, using musical instruments forms in the, um, this, uh, I think it was a uh, mixer for uh, audio mixer, or this like toaster that looked like it was really hot. Or, but that kind of product semantics has been around for a long time. Those dunces, or these guys. So Marshall McLuhan was right, the medium is the message. And in that light, I was going to talk a little bit about um, a s survey I've been working on now about like sort of uh, weapons and guns especially. And I think uh, looking at guns from a purely sort of design point of view and trying to figure out why they, why people like them so much and, and you know how the design of them affects their um, behavior. So first of all, guns um, had a big uh, impact on uh, the assembly line and um, industrialization. The Eli Whitney's first factory was actually making guns, not the uh, uh, 
cotton gin or whatever, the other thing he invented, which developed into the, um, you know, Henry Ford's um, factories. And also, like, the materials and stuff that are used in guns that are really interesting. And what is that? How do those, um, the materials and the surfaces, how do they communicate? And the overall form. And we all remember that uh, Mae West said, uh, uh, is that a gun in your pocket or are you happy to see me? <laughs> and, you know, those kind of guns back then sort of did have a strong phallic look. And, uh, you know, that kind of aspect of guns is important. These are just a couple of more phallic things. Uh, <laughs> But I think what's really what's interesting about guns is they're really a um, prosthetic device. They they extend our hand basically, and like as a and there's the art aspects. But um, hey, it's not just the music. There we go. So James Bond. But anyway, I, I started out looking at like just regular cowboy um, guns. And like, it's interesting to see how, you know, what the, if you just look at those um, four different parts of it, the, you know, how you, the thing you aim with, the part that you flip back in, uh, that hits the bullet and makes it go out, and uh, the trigger and the handle. It's interesting to see like how they, these different guns like use those same devices, and how they like change. And also the differences from different um, countries and cultures. I like the the Nazi one versus the Israeli one. Then this whole, there's a whole bunch of guns like this, like boxy little guns. How about the Soviet one that has like their little communist uh, star on it? Or the Saturday Night Special. Has the same kind of details and everything. The James Bonds. Or the men in black one, which I, I think it's interesting to look at the um, how the you know the Hollywood takes the these symbols and stretches them out and makes them even more you know interesting. Or Buck Rogers ray gun, or then toys and Nerf guns, paint guns. So this paint gun looks more scary than those regular guns. This one, whoa. And then, you know, the screw gun, staple gun, spray gun, hair dryer, spray bottle, squirt gun. And then, who knows what's up with this one, but Philippe Stark made them into lamps. <laughs> but, you know, where, how do they fit in society? And like, what do they, they do bad things. And this guy from the NRA decided that only the good guys should have guns, but who decides who's the good guy? So let's talk about good stuff anyway, so that's more important. So there's good and bad, and the bad is like hell and all that stuff, and then good is like some god or somebody trying to tell us what to do. But the trick about good and bad is like they're, you know, like in Wicked, the good witch was so good that she was bad, and the bad witch was so bad that she was good. It's like, what, how do you um, decide what's what? How, and it's up to you guys to measure, because you have to, you should be doing good stuff. And so how do you decide? You could use the chart from New York Magazine and where, so is, are the Nazis like lowbrow and despicable, or how about the church? 
or that um, cool water barrel. It goes Mickey Mouse, Enron, Exxon, Hello Kitty. You know, you can, you should figure this stuff out. <coughs> Obama. Because it's like, how do you decide what's good anyway? Is it form and function? Is it good for the user? Is it good for people? Good for humanity? Good for nature? Good for the planet? Is it about good for understanding? Is it about the meaning of life? I guess. So you guys have, you're the next generation. You're the ones that have to really figure out what better is. And I think part of better is being smarter. And what I think design does is take stuff that's good for us and making it into what we want. <laughs> so, but we always have to remember that the intended uses don't actually line up with what we think they're supposed to be when we uh, designed them. So, that's it. Fantastic. <laughs> So we have time for questions now? Well, we, what we do, we, we have, you and I have a little bit of a conversation first, and then we'll have some questions. Okay. Um, boy, not much, to, not much to cover there. It's really, uh, <laughs> really spare. Uh, well, first of all, I, I didn't know about the provenance of your first name. And of course, how many, how many people in here, probably not your age, but um, who was it who did the film Tucker probably 20 years ago? Yeah, it's the, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, is Jeff Daniels in it? Or? No, Jeff Bridges was in Jeff it. Jeff Bridges. And I, when I went to uh, Japan, the Japanese, the, they're like, oh, we're glad to see the son of Preston Tucker. And I said, I'm not the son of Preston Tucker. And they go, but we saw the movie and you look like him. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a super cool, um, it's, a, it's a good movie and it's a cool car. I mean, a yeah. really amazingly cool car. Um, by the way, if you're interested in um, design and cars, actually, the Boston area has an amazing museum in Brookline called the Lars Anderson Museum, which all, all through the summer you can go. And like every Saturday, they have a different, we went, I took my son to see a whole bunch of Raymond Lowy designed cars there that were just, you know, astonishing. Anyway, it's just nice little. I think they have a Tucker there, actually. Maybe they do. They have, I'll tell you what they, what they do have, a, a, which is a, a great design conversation in itself, is the remarkable moment when, after the Second World War, um, um, there, wasn't, there, were, there was all this production capacity for airplanes and so forth, but there wasn't necessarily uh, a ton of wealth in a lot of these countries. And so um, uh, companies like the German aircraft manufacturer Messerschmitt made little tiny cars out of what had been the, the, um, uh, the cockpits of, of, uh, of the airplanes. So it's a, it's a sort of yeah. miraculous little moment of intersection in design. But, um, you know, it's funny. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can talk about here. One of the things I should share with you at the start is that there are like eight words that we have been using as reference points during this course. And, and as I say, this is a course for a lot of people who have never taken a design course before. There are a bunch of architects in here too, but the whole point is maybe to um, meet with people from lots of different fields and tease out what design really is. And then your work is really in incredibly helpful in that regard. But the, the, just so you know, the, the eight words are um, question, as in are we answering or asking the right question, context, this narrative or story behind a design, empathy, um, as in understanding the problem from the user's perspective, iteration, these are all words you've used, I'm sure, metaphor, uh, visualization, synthesis, and finally leadership, i.e. How, how can these tools be maybe used to some uh, end beyond only answering the questions posed by others, let's say. But, um, I wonder if you can, I mean, you, your, your, your presentation was so thorough and, and, and good. I, I wonder, though, if you can, really, I mean, it's, it's very impressive. But these guys right now are working on um, uh, doing a, an experience map. 
in other, of, 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 of any enterprise they want to do. And I thought it might be helpful because for a lot of them, even though um, they've read um, Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs, <laughs> even though they have seen uh, an experience map uh, done by Starbucks to try to, that tries to break that down into all the requisite parts and, 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 and read about how Apple does the same sort of thing. I wonder if you might talk to us a little bit about, um, because so much of what you do seems to me to be understandable in terms of experience, um, like certainly the hotel, but also certainly you have, like with the, with the OXO things, there's an idea about an experience that crosses across many products. And I wonder if, it, like, how did you, how did you think self-consciously about experience in, in either of those settings? Is that, is that too complicated a question? No, but I think that, it, that if you take those two uh, examples, they were completely different. Right. You know, the, the, um, with the good grips, it was like really functional. It was like, how are you going to, how is the biomechanics of somebody's hand going to work with these, um, with, you know, simple things like a peel or a knife or something like that. Mm -hmm. And when, when we did, uh, we did research, was, so we, we made those models and we had people with uh, arthritis come in and try and use our tools and stuff. But um, in that case, it was like this one person came in and she had such bad arthritis that she really couldn't bend her fingers at all. And it was like um, a real um, emotional awakening for the designers to see how bad this situation was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas with the... Um, the uh, casino, it was like our, we were trying to figure out how to make some, you know, spectacular thing that people would remember and tell their friends about. Right. That was the, right, right. That was the, you know, the criteria. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, that, that makes tons of sense. And not only that, it's also, it's also touches on the distinction we've been making between the sort of one-off and the scalable thing, the thing that you're going to make a million of if you're successful. Um, but it also, but I, it, I mean, I think what you're saying is it really, I, I really appreciate that because as they're as they're thinking about their ex, their experience mapping enterprise, I, I've gotten a couple of questions like, well, I was thinking about doing an experience map of 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 you know my local bodega, for example, but I thought, well, it wasn't clear enough in my view what the um, what the overarching performance expectation of the bodega, aside from selling you the, uh, the pack of cigarettes. I mean, at least with, with OXO, there, you, there was one specific criterion that you could apply, whether it's a cheese grater, a knife, or anything, if it is not, first and foremost, easier to hold and use, it's not, it's not upholding the message of the OXO thing. Right. Yeah. But you can also see how the <coughs> that um, evolved. To be like basically stuff with black rubber on right, it, right, right, right. But um, and the other thing that was interesting about it was that you know that we through most of the design we were designing it for old people and handicapped people, right. and then we realized that we weren't going to sell enough of them, right. and it would they would because they were going to be, you know, specially made they were going to be too expensive for um, the, our target market. So that was like one of the other things that made us realize that, hey, universal design. It, and um, so when we um, when we packaged them and stuff, we never said on the, there that they were for old people or, right. you know, if you have a handicap, you'll want these, <laughs> right. you know, because then the, everybody else wouldn't want them. Right, right, right. No, that's really, that's... that's so th that's the point cool. of that is that good ideas come from anywhere. Mm. You know, you just have to figure out what the idea is. So, like, also with the, doing the mapping of the bodega, I think is, you know, the idea of going in there and looking at um, the experience in small pieces and, and everything, you, who knows what you're going to figure out. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. I, I, um, and I guess what you could do in, in that setting is, um, is once you break down the experience into a, a bunch of parts, it seems to me 
almost certain that it will reveal things to you about the requisite parts that were not apparent when you were still understanding it as a single blurry right. whole. Um, that, you know, you know, the whole idea of decontextualizing things, I think, is something we've talked about. But I think that's the thing with, um, with the multidisciplinary approach is that you have analysis and synthesis. So it's not just like you can't rely on just breaking it up into tiny pieces and that's going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. you, have, you also have to look at it and go like, what? Hey, how can this go together? Or there something from the, uh, you know, space shuttle is going to be helpful in this bodega, you mm -hmm. know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to be ready for both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know Marsha Lawson uh, from University of Illinois, Chicago? She's, a, she's a, another very good designer we had in her earlier, and she talked about how at, at their office they create these little you know, project rooms where they just cover the walls with all kinds of things relevant, whether they're detailed financial analysis or their ideas about form or whatever. And they're all, in, and then they go in that room to work on things so it makes easier and more likely the kind of intuitions maybe that you're, yeah. that you're talking about. Um, so, okay, let me jump to another issue. Do you know, I, sorry to make this a do you know exercise, but another person in this, in this enterprise has been Peter Dixon. Uh -huh. a firm called Profit in New York, yeah. and they do, uh, he's more on the branding and identity side. But, but he talks about, for him, um, there was a sort of aha moment. Um, he worked, uh, he's trained as an architect, worked at Skidmore Rowings in Merrill in the 80s, and we both did, and so we shared on that, and we shared that kind of experience. And he said, for him, the aha moment was transforming from um, the sort of one of, designing the one of projects that were really all about just a single person's aesthetic sensibility only to this much more empathetic, responsive world where it's really about understanding what, uh, what the problem is before you, and being open about how to solve it before you end up solving it. And um, uh, I, that, that, really, that really connected for me. And, and, and I, I really can see how that's a, completely different understanding of design as a much more participatory enterprise than as a, you right. know, a lot of architects are trained in, maybe in the Raymond Lowy mode where they make aut autonomous decisions that don't work in groups. Right, but on the other thing, I have also had this um, uh, Portuguese architect friend of mine who said, why do you Americans always think of things as problems mm, mm, mm. to be solved. You know, right. there's a lot of things that aren't a problem. Right, 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 right. That's true, and I'm I'm very guilty of that. Actually, <laughs> it's like a that's a, you know, we have we have multi, we have uh, problems that occur at multiple levels in our lives. This is that's a core problem for me. That's not a Just that's the, not an easily corrected whole, superficial problem. <laughs> no, the whole idea of seeing everything as a problem is you a see problem. What I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so. Uh, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about um, uh, the um, this sort of hardware-software distinction that you made. I mean, you, I, I know you made it jokingly about your own, about your family, but but it seems that that is an increasing part of uh, multidisciplinary design today. That there's especially because there's literally software involved oftentimes, and you know, especially right. in the context of something like Apple. Um, the well, let me let me be more specific. Like uh, Jobs talks about um, the 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 core, you know, idea at Apple was always vertical integration and controlling the entire user experience, and therefore they made some business mistakes early on because they were so committed to that. And later, the, those or they they re they reaped the profits back. and yeah. really really came back from that. But you know, in in I mean, it's just interesting. Like there's a lot there's some products that you can imagine being able to vertically, or some experiences, I should say, that you can imagine one operation being able to vertically integrate. But there's lots and lots of others that are going to have to exist at various points in, in an experience. Anything in your own design experience that kind of addresses that issue? Like, a, for example, like at the casino, I suppose, one is trying to control the experience vertically as much as possible. Well, right? I think the um, 
Uh, yeah, I think that trying to control everything is going to backfire some at some point or another. But for instance, with the casino, they they wanted to have, they were shooting to have uh, smart young, you know, business people come to that to their hotel, which is different than the people who go to other Las Vegas hotels. Big, fat, stupid, smart. I mean, uh, rich people or what dumb people who just want to throw their money away. That, those, that's what it's attracted to the other hotels. But so it backfired, though, because smart you know, business people don't gamble like that. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's how you make money in a casino. Right. So, that, you know, right. it's always something. You know? <laughs> right, right. For, right, for the... Uh, a designing casino for the financially responsible young person. It's, true. Yeah. it's probably not an excellent demographic. No. Right. Exactly. Um, so, uh, um, the, by the way, this this reference to Gordon Lippincott is is really interesting because I'm not a you know I, I'm 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 learning more about the provenance of all these firms just teaching this course uh, because my education is a, as an architect. But Lippincott then became Lippincott Margulies. Is yeah. That right. Yeah. 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 Which, which is a, I, I think it went on to be, very big in this, branding and identity field. Yeah, I think they were the, um, you know, there's, Unimark and those other kinds of uh, corporate identity companies, but um, Lippincott was more, um, you know, like you're talking about the whole experience. It was like, you know, how can you, um, you know, like Exxon was one of their clients, so they designed the. Was it Exxon? One of, some gas company was one of the, you know, so they designed the logo and the gas station and the uniforms and the, you know, the whole, basically the whole brand. Right, right. And they, they sort of invented that idea of branding, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. I think is the, is more like a, it's the holistic approach to a company. It's like, what's the, uh, what's your big idea? And then you can figure out what, how to, do all your job better. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it is one of the key takeaways from, you know, the question of how maybe design migrated from um, something that one would talk about with regard to attire or furniture or, or, or jewelry or something like that to something that has far greater impact today or can have far greater impact today because it's so integrated with value across the whole spectrum. Um, and it, it seems to me that one of the things that we learn in this class is that it is that tying design to value, whether it's a brand or any, or some other form of empathy. Actually, I mean, this is for Peter Dixon the most important of those eight words was empathy and understanding the world through the eyes of someone else, or not just through the eyes, maybe through the grip of somebody else. Right. Um, uh, that that you can provide value in a way that you wouldn't have thought you could if you look at only from the from your own point of view, right? Well, I think that empathy is so much more important now because <clears throat> if you look back in history, like you know, it used to be somebody invented a steam engine or something like that, and that was like, now let's figure out what to do with it, mm -hmm. as opposed to now since we can do almost anything we want, mm -hmm. um, figuring out how to make you know people happier is. Um, you know, much more important. Mm -hmm. We were talking before we came over here about the revolution in prosthetic limbs, which is really true, by the way. I don't know if you know, but it used to be they were just awful. <laughs> and I, I think really just in the last 15 or 20 years, they have, uh, in, uh, or, uh, parallel to the digital exploded. revolution, just exploded into, <laughs> you know, well, one hopes not too frequently, but uh, uh, become unbelievably responsive and lifelike and able to make millions of calculations about your weight and your balance and so forth that would never predict what you're going to do. Yeah, which is a little disturbing actually. <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I'm glad I still have these that, that, that have to, that answer to me. And, and, and no, but uh, they, they don't, they don't just answer to you. You, they um, anticipate stuff, you mm. know, your, your um, body, that's what's smart about your body is it's not just doing what's happening now, but it's yeah. like, anticipating what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
that's why you don't fall over. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Or as often as I would otherwise. <laughs> right, right. You, you, know, you know now, there's, there's a lot oh. of falling over. Um, so we talked about the, um, so maybe just tell us a little bit about this OXO thing which became such a phenomenon. And I don't know, I assume that most all of you have seen these things. You've got a target or you any You probably have things. them. Yeah, how many of you have an OXO handle thing? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't the rest of you have them yet? Yeah, what's around? <laughs> They're sort of, what are you, sort of ostentatiously able-bodied? Is that it? <laughs> Maybe they don't have a kitchen. Oh. That's true. Or on a meal plan or... That's true, or, or you know, I guess there are. Now, uh, and how about, um, you were with Frog Design. <laughs> what, what are some of the things you, you worked on when you were with them? Because they became what, a, a, a very... Yeah, they're a bit, um, They th still exist? Yeah. yeah. They, they were bought and sold and bought, you know, and just like Razorfish, so it's like not exactly the same place, but it's um, the same name. Mm. But. One of the projects that I was working on for, um, with them, which was also an interesting project, we, it was, our, the, the client was Motorola, and Motorola was designing a um, $18 billion satellite program for, um, you know, uh, satellite phones, basically. And so they hired A.T. Kearney, which is a um, business consultant in, um, Boston to help them figure out whether this was a good idea or not. And so they, A.T. Kearney was smart enough that they, they hired Frog to um, do some, they were running all the numbers and stuff and figuring out the legal side of it, everything and they thought why don't we see what the thing could look like. Right, right. And so, but, so we, um, the problem is that you had to have this antenna on your roof that was bigger than this table. Right. And um, also you had to chop down some trees around your house so that you could get, you could see these satellites. And um, so we told them that there, were, <coughs> there was like two things to do. Either you sort of camouflage the thing so it didn't show up too much on your house or you made it into some status symbol right. so you right. could right. say like, oh look, <coughs> I have that satellite up yeah. there. And um, so we designed these things, and then um, we presented them to the board of uh, Motorola. And uh, they, they're like, thank you, very, that's very nice. You know? And then they, they said to each other, like, um, would you put that on your house? And the other guy goes, no. And they go, they canceled the project. Mm. They canceled an $18 billion project based on their gut feeling of like, I'm not putting that on my house. Right, 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 right. And which was probably smart, because like the cell phones took off after that, and it was right. like, they didn't need all those satellites. Right, 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 right. But it's interesting to see like, that's how big business decisions end up being like, I don't feel like it, or I want to do that, I would want one, right, you know, that right. kind of thing. Well, so much of big business decisions maybe these days are based on uh, they, they, they win or lose on consumer preference, which is something that one can, uh, you know, if it, were, if it were a pure scientific question that a, a board member would feel that had to be outsourced to an expert, it pro would probably be different. But if it's something like, we're, we're going to have to sell 300 million of these things for this to be a success, and if no one at this table <laughs> would buy one, that's a that's very a bad problem. side. <laughs> but that's also how... Steve Jobs was successful, though. He would, like, ram through the idea anyway. Yeah. Well, he's got that great line, right, which is, of course we didn't. He was asked, like, in the 90s, well, have you market tested this? Of course, I can't market test it. They don't even know what they want. I haven't even yeah. told them what they want. There. What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that that is a winning argument at any board meeting, note to self. Okay. You probably... Well, it is if you got the, you know, if you got the uh, balls. Yeah. A, a lot of... Um, and I imagine there are other people who have said such things that, uh, uh, that who have not been successful. My, my only point, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to uh, ask students to be excessively cautious, but I do think it is uh, erroneous lessons are learned when the, o the only story you ever hear is the, is the home run success right. of, of any activity. 
Um, and you know, one of the things about reading this biography, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to read this book by Isaacson, it's pretty interesting. I've seen plenty. There's been plenty of it around. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but you know, the reality of this guy versus what we, what it was easy to infer over all these years is just, is quite, the difference is quite stark. <laughs> it's like a, it's a very unusual character. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, so, um, what are, are, are there, are there any projects in, that you've been involved with that you would particularly like to <coughs> talk about uh, for a group like this? Um, I, mean, I, have, I have some more questions I can ask you, but I, but I, I just, I, I wanted to know if, for a group that's trying to understand how design uh, is something that, let's say, they can use if they're not, you know, I guess one of our, one of our arguments here is that um, design thinking is really a, a kind of just how higher level, multivariable, complicated decisions are best dealt with. <laughs> You know that that you, you showed a diagram briefly about the sort of iterative cyclical feedback nature of design, and I think a lot of people who are not in design fields imagine no, no, it's uh, some kind of magic like artistic ability that that I, I, and I don't think I have it, so I'm not gonna. It's not a road I'm gonna go down, and I, I think this. I'm trying to have this course be something of an antidote to that kind of thing that you can learn how to employ some of these approaches. Well, first of all, everybody already is a designer, you know, so you, everybody designs themselves when they get up in the morning and pick out what they're going to wear, right. you know, design doesn't have to be, uh, you know, making stuff necessarily, right. you know, right. but I think that it's, for me, it's like black and white, it's like design is like making a conscious decision about what you're going to do versus like not, right. Right. you know, you know, throwing dice or something, or um, you know, just taking what happens. You know, so it's a, like a human. It's why humans are like successful, right, right. as opposed to you know rabbits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> they have a different um, strategy, rabbits. <laughs> well, the idea of having an intention. I mean, in, in some ways, this is what. I think the, these, uh, I hope that these experience maps will either reveal or expose the absence of. In, as you break down some of these experiences, um, it will reveal a, 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 a very clear intention all along the way. Or you'll see, wow, this, here's a part of this experience that is completely haphazard and utterly left to chance and as a result is not reinforcing the story that right. is purportedly trying to be told or something like that. Um, in, in architectural reviews, we have, a, uh, we, have a, we have a throwaway line about this, which is called um, um, a project suffering from intention deficit disorder. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I like that. And it's true. I mean, you can really tell it doesn't, it's not about a skill. It's about, it's about not having an intention. Uh, but yeah, I'm sorry, please. Oh, wait, wait, I want to say one thing before she. Sure, sure. What I think is the. the um, also, there's, like I said, there's unintended consequences of what you do, and um, there's, mil there's books written about like screw-ups that humans did, right? right? And you never know how long it takes for the thing to backfire. But I think that's what's important about being iterative, is that you are addressing those things all along, and, you, and you, uh, when things start to go wrong, you try and fix them. Um, you know, on, on that note, one of the topics that we've, we haven't talked about enough, but I, I think we'll talk about it a bit more as the course goes on, is this whole notion of fast fail, which I find so, so fascinating. Where software designers have talked to us about that, um, that there used to be a model for producing software that was really linear and took a really long time, and you would design it and build the, write all the code, and then you wouldn't test it until you were Months and months and millions works. of dollars invested in it. And you'd find out it, it, it fails on a number of points and you'd have to go back and start again. And now they're trying to come up with ways to make it fail as quickly as possible <laughs> so you start to understand what all the obstacles are early before you've spent all that dough. But I, I think that Google is a good example of that. They have like millions of people like just doing 
stuff at random, it seems, <laughs> and whatever like bubbles up to the top is what know. they pursue and invest in investing. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Thank you. It, it's, it's actually, it's just for our recording. It's not to amplify you in this room. Okay. I want to, hi, Tucker. Hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. I'm curious about design for development. Maybe I'm channeling your mother, my dear <laughs> other mother, and uh, the software side. The picture of the woman pushing a water barrel, that is really ingenious. And it seems a lot of that in your presentation. What, the ingenious stuff? or Oh, it was all ingenious, <laughs> and it was all intentional. But the design for development, a lot of the projects are for people who, who have money to burn. Right. Sure. Well, first of, uh, first of all, that's part of the problem of being a design consultant is that you, uh, you know, get people pay you to design stuff so that they can make money from it. And uh, so... But that's why I'm, I'm hoping for the, uh, the good grips that are going to get my ticket to, uh, <laughs> you know, something for humanity. But I think that uh, I, I also rationalize it in, in another way, like the casino um, lobby, what's, it's so spectacular, it's so amazing to be in there that I hope that it, people, you know, it makes people feel like they can, that there's, you know, there's more possibilities than they thought of before and that they go, they get inspired to do something themselves. That's a, that's sort of my rationalization of, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, it's not going to, it's not helping, you know, earthquake victims in uh, um, Haiti especially, but maybe someone will, will go through there and go like, man, I got, this is great. I got to go do something in Haiti, right, right. you know? Well, That's my plan. It, it certainly does seem that there is a, there is a, a, a long list of um, um, problems <laughs> to be solved in, in the developing world for which, um, you know, high-level design thinking would be a wonderful and welcome Antidote. I mean, you know, whether it's uh, portable uh, housing for for victims of disaster and so forth. You know, the good news is I think this generation is actually, you know, it's all cyclical. But I think this generation is much more interested in that kind of social engagement, frankly, than than mine was. Um, and I think there's more. Uh, I think, the, you know, we, what we don't have probably are the systems uh, in place to support that sort of work on a large scale, it's still very ad hoc. One person comes up with a clever thing where you use water to provide the weight to roll the earth. Um, you know, the, another one in that same vein, by the way, that I, I saw recently developed is, um, how many times have we all seen the uh, television footage of uh, flooding, like on the Mississippi or someplace like this? And you see these people desperately um, throwing sandbags piling up sandbags around their house, and you think, boy, that does not look like a winning hand, right? You know, you see them, they're just putting, piling sandbags on top of sandbags in a big circle around their house as the Mississippi floods, and you think, that just doesn't look like it's going to work. And it seldom does, actually. Well, now there's a new kind of um, temporary barrier that is a big, long tube that you fill with water, and then you put another one on top of it and another one on top of it, and their weight and ability to conform to the piece underneath it actually are much better and, perhaps more importantly, much faster than sandbags. So you can have your own little water-filled protection wall that's, that's much better. That's good. I mean, I, it's I like a reverse uh, kiddie pool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Exactly right. Um, but then along those lines that, you know, they were... We had a lot of flooding in New York because of Sandy, and um, the Dutch were going like, "Why do you, why are you waiting until you get a disaster before you do something? Right. Right. You know what's going to happen." The Dutch are like, "Oh, you know, we're getting ready." Yeah. To be fair, that I mean, first of all, all of I mean, I, 
and all the architects in here were big fans of the Dutch because how can you not be? They, they, right. they're, they're big innovators in that area. Um, but of course, nothing focuses the mind like uh, there. Of course, if they didn't have those, they'd already be dead. I mean, right. words, like nothing focuses the mind like imminent death, <laughs> and uh, and and the Dutch have been facing imminent death for like 400 years. So, um, like we're here, we're saying, well, yeah, but how about if we don't? We'd rather not pay any taxes at all. Right. Um, there was a candidate. Does that cost money? What I, are you gonna? I won't name the candidate, but there was a candidate in the last. Uh, election cycle, who when asked, well, what do you think is the appropriate level of federal taxation? This candidate answered, none. And I thought, oh, well, that, that's go. helpful, OK? Yeah. <laughs> Finally, somebody answered a political question with clarity. That is a very, thank you, <laughs> candidate X, that is a very helpful answer. Let's move on to candidate Y. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but to be fair, they are, you know, the Dutch do this because if they hadn't been doing this for hundreds of years, their country wouldn't exist. Uh, when we're faced with, uh, as we perhaps are beginning to be faced with, uh, more of this, um, th that's going to change. You know, in North Carolina, the legislature has forbidden um, any law that makes reference to either climate science or uses the term, <laughs> I'm not making this up, rising waters or, you know. Uh, 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 they can't make any laws about that? Yeah, they're not allowed to. They've, 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 or they're they, not allowed to say that. They're not allowed. <laughs> <law. laughs> I don't know exactly what it, you should. You all should Google it. But it's it's truly it's truly great. astonishing. Uh, but I but that's not what, what this course is about. Yes, sir. Um, first of all, thanks for being here. Um, on a note for designing products for social impact, I was actually at a lecture at a presidential lecture at Blackman yeah, a few days ago. Yeah. Uh, and Professor Govindar John of Tuck, of, uh, Tuck School of Business uh, was talking about a $30 prosthetic limb that was made out of um, yogurt plastic uh, ca um, Container. containers. Um, and I thought that was ingenious and I just wanted to mention that. Um, as far as a question, I wanted to know where do you look for ideas and inspiration when you when you design or you make suggestions? And do you do that on a regular basis, look for ideas uh, just to be informed? Or when you want to find something out, do you search for it? Well, I think you do, or I do, all of the above. You know, so you know, sometimes you just get a good idea all of a sudden out of thin air. Mm -hmm. Or, um, but. I think there's, you know, there's lots of different ways to delve into uh, projects like, you know, doing an experience <laughs> map or, you know, watching someone do something or finding a new material. You know, that was part of the thing with um, Good Grips was the rubber handle happened because I went to a, um, in, to a focus group by uh, Monsanto who had like this new product and they were like you know they just gave us samples of this like rubbery injection molding moldable rubber and um, like six months later we're designing these things and we're like hey what if we, what, what was that stuff that you got where did you know maybe we could use that mm -hmm. you know so it's like you never know what's gonna where that inspiration comes from that you know it's it's you know you have to take the, you also have to boil stuff down into an actual thing at some point. And so that's also um, a, a difficult process, I think. It's a, actually, boiling stuff down is harder for me than thinking up wacky new ideas. Mm -hmm. So, But when you collaborate with people, my guess is that you collaborate with people, some of whom are, like, are, are, okay, are, are better stop. boilers down. Yeah. Okay, now... We have to cleave off these otherwise interesting things. It's right. like editing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, I was speaking with an editor the other day who's, who's really good. And she was remarking that I seemed happily unbothered by the fact that she had cut 700 words out of this thing I'd written. And I said, well, that's because you know, editors are like designers. And, and that you, it's your job. It's true. You cut off this. There was this one bit that I particularly favored, this one line, and I thought it was really.
clever, and I don't know if it would get me into heaven like, like good grips, but I thought it would advance me in that direction. Uh, and it lay, it lay on the editing room floor, but nevertheless, the, the, the you whole... Can always, you can pick I'll it up use it and use it for oh, the believe next me. thing. <laughs> believe me, I reached out and put it in my pocket. I'm going to use it for something else, exactly. Other questions? Yeah, here. So in your story, you've been involved and it seems like you've started a lot of different companies and design companies. So why, why is that it that you started a bunch of different ones rather than building one, making it huge? Well, uh, I think it gets back to that thing that we were just talking about. I got, like, um, it would have been smarter for me to stay at SMART, I think, on, you know, looking back at my career now. I think it was like, you know, it was a great company. It was a smart name. You know, the, everybody I worked with was great, you know. But so I, I, you know, just look around and see, you know, what looked more interesting. And so I think that the, one of the big problems with Smart was that I had these friends who started Razorfish, which was like the digital, you know, crazies and that was like they I thought that um, you know that digital stuff was going to be really important and that we should I tried to get them to merge with um, smart but that my partners at smart were like I don't know that stuff is like not industrial design you know mm -hmm. la 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 mm -hmm. so I ended up going with the digital guys but then that bubble burst so mm -hmm. But it's still like the digital that I still totally believe in that idea that, you know, the digital and the physical are going to merge together into, you know, into one experience. You know, these phones are going to be gone pretty soon. Right, right, right. How much smaller can they get? Right, right. <laughs> kind of messy. <laughs> it's probably critically important. <laughs> I know that all, I know that all thirteen hundred that I get every day are. are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it does make you wonder what it was like before we got five hundred messages a day, right? How did we even function? And and yet we did, nevertheless. <laughs> well, just think like these uh, iPhones have only been around for four years. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Is it that sh short a time? Anyway. Yeah. They totally. I. What a gigantic and fast like revolution! Yeah, 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 yeah. We went out for dinner last night, and we had it change our reservation like twelve times or something. A little, I don't know why the restaurant cared, but we thought we needed to. Uh, <laughs> and now, of course, this is you. First, we're going to create a problem, and then give you a way to solve it. Yeah, it's, exactly. Uh, it's getting back to the earlier planned obsolescence uh, idea, I think. It's a new one, yeah. So, um, other questions? Yeah, here. I, I'm, I, I'm so tempted to toss it up there, but if, if I blow you it up. You did say you fell over a lot, so. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it. Is good versus bad like a function of quality of life? Like, what I mean by this is that uh, does, does it, Basically, if improving quality means it's good, whereas not improving quality of life, either ergonomically or not, automatically it means that it's bad. For take example, fishing. I mean, if you bring new technology to make fishing better, like rods, uh, I don't know, they have automatically new automaticized systems. Uh, to catch fish, or just simply like good old times, and you know, just throw the rod and wait for hours for it. <laughs> well, I think that that's what you have to figure out for yourself, because I I don't think that um, yeah, it's up to to you to figure out what's good and bad, and um, but I think one test for that is like to test with somebody else to see if they think it's good or bad too. Like I think like the Nazis really thought they were doing they thought they were great and doing really good things, you know. 
But if you ask the Jews, they don't have the same idea. So it's like <laughs> that's a good test on whether it's really good or not. Well, the, it, it's a, that's a, actually a great question because the um, – and, and let me give a couple of examples on the fishing front because it's, it's a great choice. No, no, it's an excellent choice because fishing – I would divide – fishing is something I would immediately break apart into constituent parts. Fishing is not simply – a practical matter of getting a fish to eat. It might involve that, but actually, I would venture to say that most people who fish in the United States, for example, by themselves, are that's not actually the primary thing. In other words, it, it's relaxation, it's f getting back to nature, it's not doing something else <laughs> for a period of time. It's a number of things for which functional efficiency may or may not, or an ergonomic sensibility may or not may not be the issue. For example, how many of you have walked down like a fishing pier in Florida or someplace like that? You know, there's a bunch of old coots down there and they're, they've got 20 different poles in, in holders of various kinds. They, you know, they, 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 they fancy themselves some sort of minor industrial fishing operation um, and they're all talking with one another. The act of fishing is almost, it, it barely even registers on that experience, I would say. So this is a perfect example where experiencing, experience mapping, I think, could reveal to you some things about fishing that would not be initially apparent without being self-conscious about it. Um, so. But also, I think it, you pointed out there's like lots of different kinds of fishing. Sure, sure. You know, so nothing is that simple. Right. In, the, in the 70s, there was, a, there was an incredibly popular <coughs> invention in the world of fishing. What? There was? We didn't hear about it. Yes. Uh, it was called pocket the Pocket fish. Fisherman. <laughs> Have you ever heard of this? No, it's, it's great. I, it's, it's really, this is a real reward for getting older. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Despite YouTube and everything else. The Pocket Fisherman was this little thing that was sold on television by hucksters. Um, and the idea was that you could go fishing anytime. You didn't need a pole. You had it. I don't know if it didn't actually fit in your pocket, but it was about this big. And it had a, it had a reel. It had various storage right. in it. And I think it had like a flip out, so it was like. Yeah, yeah it, it had a tiny bit of a run. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, I don't think it was for catching swordfish. But, no. uh, but the idea was that at, at a whim, you could decide to go fishing. And that this was now going to afford you a freedom to fish that had previously been denied you. Now, whether this was actually a problem or not, there's <laughs> Uh, but I had a friend, a famous this friend of mine um, was selling those. He like had the I don't know the franchise now, and basically he they make money on shipping. <laughs> is that right? Shipping and handling is the whole yeah. is the whole thing. Yeah, so yeah. like they go buy if you buy two, you get you get what uh, you get the second one free or something yeah, like yeah. that. But it was also like more shipping. Right, 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 right. This is the famous Ron Popeil as I right. recall, the f legendary uh, right. television huckster. Uh, anyway, the, the, uh, the, 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 this all came before the ads that you see now on television for any, all myriad products, the sort of low-end late-night ads. They show a normal person doing an activity that is in no way dangerous or problematic, but it shows them almost killing themselves, usually in grainy black and white. Have you seen these? This is perfect. Actually, OXO should do these because it says it, it creates, a, it defines a problem, i.e., opening your cabinet door, <coughs> it's you in the head, knocks you out, you fall to the ground, or something like this. And then the color film with the nice music that follows shows this new cabinet knob that's yeah, going to that save bounces you. Bounces off your head. <laughs> it bounces <laughs> off your head because you, right. It's for people like me. Well, the, <laughs> uh, the, Ox, the guy who founded OXO, Sam Farber, he had this company before that, which was Copco, which made oh, like yeah, yeah. kitchen sure. gadgets and stuff. And Farber makes knives, don't they? That's his uh, uncle or uh, something okay. like that. Okay. There are, it, the Farbers are in the uh, housewares <laughs> business. But anyway, he, his big successful product was the uh, salad spinner. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so he ha made this one that had like a crank that you spun around and... Um, but there were other salad spinners that did that. But his, his genius one was that his had a, the outside was a, um, a bowl. And uh, so 
what do you do is he would go like spin the lettuce and then he would go look at all the water that came out of it in the bottom of the bowl. Uh, uh, and the other ones just had like uh, perforated things. Yeah, and so the water just disappeared. So nobody knew that how good the it extent was of the excellence that they were experiencing. Yeah. <laughs> That's superb. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, well, I, Tucker, I want to thank you so much for coming. This is oh, really thank fantastic. You. Thank you.